Um, can you hear me well? Cool. Um, so I had to make a decision whether I would want to include one more example or give you more context on each example I'm going to talk about. I went with the example so you get a better picture of how we as reporters are working with the very same tools many of you in the room are using, but for somewhat different purposes. But the main tagline is how we are utilizing these tools. So this is what we're going to cover. For examples, the first one is cybercrime related. The second one is a private company working for intelligence agencies. The third one has nothing to do with cybersecurity. And the fourth one is an APT group called uh, Turler uh, and has been around for 20 years. So we're going to start with the Our Evil one. That's the name. Uh, it's also called Sodino Kibi. Uh, this is a ransomware group. They hack your network. They encrypt the data. And then they want money. And um, basically, if you know where to look, you can find these negotiations or extortions. It's basically in, within the malware, there's a ransom note. And the ransom note includes a link to an Onion site. And if you have the key, you can enter the chat. And if you can enter the chat, you can try and talk with the hackers, which is what I did once after the negotiation failed. I asked them, hey, do you guys want to speak with me about the thing you're doing? They deleted it within a minute. But afterwards, uh, we published a story. And some, a source told us, if you want to know who these guys are, I do. I can give you the names. And we were thinking, OK, definitely, we want to hear this. But since we are talking about a person connected to ransomware, and ransomware has to do with cryptocurrencies, because that's how they get paid, and cryptocurrencies are traceable, we should be able to do it ourselves. So we would take all the information, but only publish if we were able to tie that person to ransomware by so to speak, publicly available information that wasn't given to us by the source. So I'm going to describe a process that's going to apply in the four other examples as well, but I'm just going to explain it once so you get the gist of it. It's a rinse and repeat. And we had at a starting point the name of the person and the Instagram account of that person's partner slash wife. So we look up the Instagram account. The account is logged, but she has a bio. And in that bio, she links another account. And the way she did it, it was very clear that she's talking about her intimate partner. We look up that account, and it's also logged, but says, in crypto, we trust in the bio. And for someone who's working allegedly with crypto and ransomware, it's not a lie. Technically, they do trust in crypto. And we have the username. We do some Googling, are able to find out an email address. That email address leads us to many domains being registered with that address. These domains are linked to phone numbers. The phone numbers are linked to a WhatsApp account. The WhatsApp account has the same profile picture as the Instagram account, so we now know it's the same person just by looking at the picture. And one, so I'm talking about this like it took me two minutes, but this happened throughout days or weeks. And the Instagram account was locked at the beginning, but in the end, it was publicly visible. So we now can see what they're doing on Instagram. Uh, you can see the person is uh, sporting a Prada blazer and has a Bitcoin watch that costs somewhere between 10 to 70,000 euros, depending on the model. For us, at that point, we thought to ourselves, everything the source gave us proved out to be correct, but we're still not there. We still don't have that connection to cryptocurrencies. So we kept on digging, and we realized that uh, there was a second email address with a different phone number, and that phone number was connected to Telegram. So we used a bot that you can, uh, that's often used in Telegram-related investigations. You give the bot a user ID, and what the bot returns you is all the groups that ID has shown up um, was a part of. And one of these groups, our, the, the guy we were looking at was the admin, and he posted a wallet address. So at that point, we thought to ourselves, if we could tie that wallet address to a ransomware group, we should be good to go, which is exactly what we were able to do, because the Binance account was paying money directly to our evil. At that point, we thought, OK, this is enough. Um, I reached out to the person via WhatsApp. 
Afterwards, within two hours, he changed the profile picture from the Instagram one to an anonymous one, which is kind of a reaction, I think. And then we published the story. And the reason I'm mentioning it on stage is, for us as journalists, we have the problem that we reach out to many sources, but they stay anonymous. And if they have wrong information, it's going to be our mistake, so we need to be able to check everything they're telling us. And for that, I love using these tools. So that would be example number one. The second one is um, uh, an investigation we released in March. It was called Vulcan Files, and basically a source approached Hannes Munzinger, this is Hannes, and shared within some weeks 5,000 pages, and the gist of the story is there's one private company out of Russia working for FSB, SVR, and GRU, which seemed odd to me because everybody kept telling me that GRU and FSB hate each other and they're not working together. And, but in the back end, apparently, they're all using the same company to build their tools, which was interesting. So we thought, okay, let's look um, at all of these pages. On the US side, uh, the Washington Post was involved. In the UK, it was The Guardian. And in Germany, it was Süddeutsche Zeitung and Der Spiegel. And we wanted to answer two questions. One, are these docs legit? And two, what's in them? And I'm going to talk about the are we being tricked part. Basically, we did all of the OSINT stuff I talked about in the first example, but here for us was the important thing, just the regular verification. Do the people really exist? Does the company exist? What do we, can we find in the registry? Do, these, uh, do they have a military background? And on some documents, you can see uh, that there are some institutes mentioned. Do they exist? Are they legit? Do they have the relevant clearance to work with state secrets in Russia? The answer was always yes. And by the way, if you want, the documents are on Document Cloud. You can find them and read through them yourself if you're interested in doing that. So that's just the basic can we check that information, yes or no? But within the documents, there are some tools that are described on a high level, basic. It was sort of a showdown, but on steroids, so they would create ultra-large databases and store all types of information within these databases, but implied was always a way the GRU would work with these findings. Mm. And this was interesting to us because if you have follow, followed what happened with the GRU, there was indeed a restructuring. And the restructuring basically said that there are some units that are of importance and some units that are just tasked with doing regional stuff. And um, an example for units that are important is APT21 and Sandworm operating out of Moscow and they have a global task list, so to speak. And on the other hand, you have units like Zebrosy, and they are distinctly working re with regional tasking. And we could see that within the documents, so that matched up as well. But it was hard to tell specifics based solely on documents. Uh, on these 5,000 pages, we had just one hash, and this is the hash, which seemed to be legit. So if you have anything as a result, just please let me know. Um, so. I thought to myself, maybe we can find some malware related to this one company. And I was able to track down, with the help of some sources, uh, an Excel file. And it has some malicious macros in it. So I used a tool named OleDump, and you can analyze the macros within that tool. There was a PowerShell script. It pulled down a second stage. And I thought, OK, this behaves like malware. Maybe it is. But essentially, it was an employee who wanted to trick his coworkers and just wish them a happy new year. This is what you're seeing. He didn't send him a happy new year card. He sent them quote unquote malware and wrote his own fancy name for this group and called himself APT Magma Bear, which was a nice find, but not really what I was looking for. But then I thought, okay, why not use all dump on the Excel files that we have within the leak? So we did that. I came across one Excel file that had password lock cheats. This is what it looks like. You have to enter the password to make adjustments to uh, the Excel file. And this password seemed to be unique. You can look uh, up on have I been pwned, how often the password 
shows up in leaked databases. In this case, it was just one time, which is pretty unique. We had access to some of these databases, and the interesting thing, and why I'm mentioning it, is this one password was solely used by a person who was also working at NTC Vulcan, which is the co company we were looking at. So it's really interesting to be able to look at the high level stuff and see that all checks out, but even the tiniest details all led back to NTC Vulcan. And after, like, at the end of our reporting, we came across uh, Google Tech, and they said, yeah, we saw the company assist SVR with phishing infrastructure back in uh, 2012, which is also a very important find during the investigation. Which brings us to number three, the non-cyber related one. It was the Xinjiang police files, um, short version of the story for the first time the world was able to see how the Uyghur minorities were being treated within the internment camps, which China insists are re-education camps. And um, as a site, like most of the pictures were mugshot-like, as you can see on, the, on this picture, but you had pictures like this as well. So I thought, why not write a script to go through all the pictures, see if you have metadata associated with them, and if yes, if we even have geolocation. Out of 5,000 pictures, I think 50 or so had geolocation associated with it. So I just looked through every picture, like I went to maps.google.com, looked at the coordinates, looked at the picture, and thought, okay, this is maybe where this picture was taken if the metadata is accurate. But then I thought to myself, there are maybe interesting pictures that do not have metadata associated with them, so I went through almost all of the pictures that were not mugshots and came across this picture, which is, I don't know how I go back. This one, no. This one, damn. Oh, yeah. If you look at the rec red rectangle, you can see, by the way, of the roof, how the roof is colored, red, white, red, and so on, like it's basically the same area, but this one was a screenshot that an officer took of his smartphone while on his patrol routes visiting people in that region. And for us it was important to have that because now we knew the metadata was accurate, one, and two, we no knew where the internment camp was located because these pictures were taken in the surrounding of that area. And so while it is important for us to use and be able to use all these technical tools, it's always important to go through the material and other way to see whether it lines up or it doesn't. In this case, it did, and it was helpful for the investigation. Last example is going to be the Turler one. Turler is an APT group working for the FSB since, depending on who you're talking with, 2003 or even 90-ish, 90s. Um, and yeah, they are, the interesting thing about that story is usually we start with the hypotheses and it either checks out or it doesn't. If it doesn't check out, we don't have a story. If it checks out, we write about it. But with Turler, it was different because we knew that the German law enforcement authorities were able to track down um, relevant people working for that group within two years because in 2018, the Federal Foreign Office was hacked in Germany, and by 2020, the um, Germans knew who was involved with that group. So we started talking with people, trying to find out um, who these hackers might be, and one of them told me it's amazing how much you can find out just by looking at openly available information. And what I did was uh, read reports that were published uh, throughout the years, and one thing these guys did was use a version, version control and they forgot to delete the names of their laptops. And two names that showed up were Gilg and Vlad. I started with Gilg and um, was told that it would be interesting to check out a forum which is called wasm.ru because there's a user with the name of Gilg posting stuff that looks awfully like things Turler did in operations. So one thing um, Gilg asked questions about was how to list logical devices on USB drives, and there's the famous operation by Turler against the um, DOD, agent.btz it's called, I think, 
and it also propagated by USBs. So I don't have a background in reverse engineering. I have to trust the people I'm talking with that this is all accurate. But I had a hard time finding out, okay, how am I going to find out anything that will help me try to understand where these guys are operating from. And there was this one post from this person, and he said, basically, happy Radio Day, everyone, and Popov has risen. And Radio Day is huge in Russia, and uh, Popov, Alexander Stepanovich Popov, um, is the guy who did the first, world's first radio receiver, and this day is celebrated at some universities, and one of these universities is, the, uh, is located in a city called Ryazan. I just jotted it down in my notes, didn't know what to do at the time, so it was all piecemeal informa information I got, and not everything is understandable the second somebody reaches out to me and tells me, hey, this is what you should be focusing on, because sometimes people think they, they're giving me a clue, but I don't know what they're trying to tell me. I just jot it down, and hopefully I'll understand it later on. So I was frustrated because I didn't get anywhere with Gilg at that time, so I said, you know what, let's do Vlad. Asked around again, with Vlad the same thing. He posted on um, various websites. I wrote a scraper in June 10th, as you can see in the screenshot, we published in February 2022, so this is like seven months beforehand, and was able to find out that this Vlad guy had an email address associated with a domain. That domain was connected to a second email address, and that was connected to a website called atlas-riazan. And th at that point, I realized, okay, we have this guild guy who might be connected to Riazan, I'm not sure, but then again, here we have a domain that is directly referencing that city. Maybe it makes sense to look closer, more closely at that second company. Atlas Riazan is, like to the short version, they were officially part of the FSB, and other stuff checked out as well. They were located in the same area. They had the same address as the FSB. And um, yeah, so that's when we knew, okay, apparently this Atlas Riazan people are directly, were directly part of the FSB, which for us was the moment where we said, okay, we should publish this because it's interesting to be able to tie attribution-wise, not just the country, not just the entity, but actually who is behind um, this intrusion over a two decades time period. We didn't name them personally because I'm from Germany and we are like somewhat strict about privacy, even if you work for a state. And um, our assumption was at that time, both CrowdStrike and BAE had published reports that they sent out to their internal, like to their paying customers, and we thought if we publish, they already know that they've been found out about, it won't make that big a difference, but apparently after we published the story, they stopped changing a certain aspect. If I'm informed correctly, but maybe somebody's going to yell at me because it's not true, I've heard that they stopped using the snake rootkit afterwards, but feel free to tell me if I'm wrong on that one. I think that's it. I'm done. I hope it was understandable. I talked very quickly. <laughs>